in seeking to stem the tide of apostasy that had reared its head among those to whom the Hebrews' epistle is addressed. Inspired writer said in Hebrews 8 and verse number 5, Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things showed to thee according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Let me emphasize this, and I make comment about it from time to time as to the value of the Old Testament lessons to us who are under the authority of the Christ in the New Testament. We can see how the Holy Spirit employed those matters of the Old Testament incorporated them into the message of the New Testament and we see how they were written aforetime for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture, scriptures might have hope. Now when we look at this particular verse we receive that it refers to the specific instructions that God gave to Moses as found in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 9. Moses knew from the revelation of God's word for his day exactly how God wanted the tabernacle built for he had God's exact pattern for it. We may also call it a blueprint. God had given it to him. If there came a time when Moses was in doubt, then all he had to do was consult the pattern that was given to him in the mount. Now, if he were to blunder as it was being made, then that mistake would have been on Moses' part, not on God's part. Either in ignoring it or else refusing to accept it as authoritative. I pause here and say today, much of the error, if not all of it, in the denominational world that gives lip service to God Christ and the Bible is the word of God is because they either refuse to accept the authoritative nature of God's word and how to ascertain that authority or they just simply ignore the pattern or deny as many among us have in the last number of years that the New Testament of Christ is a pattern. These few comments further I'll make about that. I've never understood what they thought they had when they came up and said, well, the New Testament's not a pattern. When those same brethren used the word paradigm and they continue to use the word paradigm. Well, what is a paradigm? It's a pattern. It's a blueprint. All is being said here is that God in words on our level has revealed his will to us and thereby teaches us. That's all that's being said. And that should be able to be seen from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. God has always demanded that his pattern or blueprint be followed and followed in exactness. He didn't intend for people just to sort of say, well, that's the Bible, the Word of God. It's given to save us, and I believe in God, Christ, and I'm all right. The Bible is full of material that says, search it diligently. Make sure you have the right attitude toward it, that it is God's Word, why it was given, the importance of studying to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. When you consider Noah in his day and the flood that was to come, Noah was given a pattern. If you look over in the New Testament, you'll see that in the 11th chapter, where he talks about people of the Old Testament acting by faith, you'll notice that Noah acted by faith. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Thus, he acted as the word of God 
the pattern God gave him when it came to building the ark. And Genesis 6 verse 22 says that thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now he also then understood that he was to make all things according to the pattern showed to him regarding the ark. And the scriptures plain that he obediently followed the teaching of the pattern, the guidelines of the pattern and the blueprint. Well, as you read through the Old Testament, that's how you're going to be able to understand what it is to have the church in every generation and to understand how those principles apply to us today as we seek to apply the truth of the New Testament to our lives. God has a pattern. He's given it in the New Testament for His church. Jesus promised His apostles, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. John 14 and verse 26. And thus we see the place of the apostles in giving us the will of God. The early church saw it and right after it was established in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, Verse 42 says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's teaching. That could just as well be worded that they continued according to the pattern showed the apostles. Consider that Jesus had promised to build his church, Matthew 16, 18. And in this passage, he assures us that the Holy Spirit would deliver the divine pattern for his church. Listen again to him speaking to the apostles about the work of the Holy Spirit with them. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come again John 16 13 so the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead delivered the will of Christ to it we have it in the New Testament he delivered the gospel in such a way that no man or anybody could corrupt What is that divine pattern? It's vouchsafed. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words won't. Men may make many mistakes. One thing God's assured of, we have the Bible. It's not going anywhere. Now the question I ask myself is how much do we value it? Do we really value it for what it actually is? The Word of God. On Pentecost, when the gospel was preached in its fullness for the first time, it was first then delivered. And the scripture says, as Luke records in Acts 2 and verse 4, the apostles spake as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit safeguarded the divine pattern to present it to man incorruptible and to keep it that way. Much later in speaking of the revelation of the gospel, the inspired apostle Paul asserted, but God hath revealed them, that is the things that make up the New Testament, reveal them unto us, the apostles, by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Well, I think for a moment that's because he is God. He's the rightful one to reveal the mind of God. Then he said, concerning the things that the Holy Spirit revealed, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, 
by which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The American Standard 1901 says combining spiritual thoughts, ideas with spiritual words. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 13. Where did our pattern come from? It came from God. How? By the agency of the Holy Spirit through inspired men. That's what Paul's talking about. Notice how I referred to the pattern. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. How do I know what I believe is from God or from man? How do I know whether the gospel is truly the gospel of Christ or it's been contaminated by wicked men? First of all, I'm told the Bible's going to be here and nobody can change it. But I'm also told in that book that I can study it and come to the proper knowledge of the truth. John 8, 31 and 32. If I really want to know it, can I know it? Yes. But it has to be an attitude of hungry and thirsting after righteousness. It has to be a desire to put into practice what I learned, to be a Christian and all the Bible teaches that to be. Of course, the Apostle Paul, as did one way or the other, all the apostles and inspired writers, gave a sober warning concerning the importance of following the pattern and not to deviate from it. He said, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Then he said, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But other foundation can no man lay than is laid which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11. Here's what's being said. We, the members of the church, the children of God, Christians, the saints of God, we then constitute the body of Christ, the church, God's building. Paul is a wise master builder, an apostle of Jesus Christ, doing what God expected the apostles to do, as did all the apostles, laid the foundation, the true and tried foundation, who is Jesus Christ. And that's all according to God's blueprint or pattern. He then gives a dire warning to all of us to build only upon that foundation, that is, according to the blueprint or pattern. This will ensure the salvation of the spiritual building, the church, and all the members of it. He said something like that to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. He says to them, and so to all true Christians, ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Again, that's Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now you'll notice in these two passages, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11 and Ephesians 2 passage, in one he says Christ is the foundation, the other says the chief cornerstone. The foundation, of course, supports the superstructure, and that would be us, members of it, the stones, living stones in the building. But pictured as the cornerstone, then it's on that cornerstone which everything else lines up. So Christ is not only the proper foundation that upholds the whole superstructure of the church, but he's also the cornerstone that keeps it all lined up keeps things decently and in order. And that we need to understand. So we see that the Lord's house is built according to the divine pattern. 
that Paul and the other apostles received from Jesus Christ. Paul wrote his young son, as he would call him in the gospel, Timothy, these words, hold fast the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 1.13. And that's the way it was meant to be. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, he talks about handing it on down. That's the tradition that is acceptable in the Lord's church. It is traditional of the Lord's church to hand down the truth and not deviate from it. Notice the emphasis that Paul gave to this. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Titus 2, 7 and 8. And that sound speech is necessary to fulfill living according to the pattern in preaching it. And again, the inspired apostle said, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, which means wholesome teaching. Well, that would be according to the pattern, Titus 2 and verse 1. Paul even charged that an elder, and especially elders, must be adept in holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able... Notice, by sound doctrine, there's that wholesome teaching, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, Titus 1 and verse 9. Well, this sound doctrine is the pattern, it's the divine blueprint, and it's expected of God concerning us that we keep it pure and not deviate from it. Now, notice how zealously Paul guarded this pattern. When he wrote to the church in Galatia chapter 1, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God unto another gospel. Literally a gospel of a different kind from what I preached to you when you were converted. He says there's not another of a different kind. There's only one. In the Greek, you have two words. One meaning for the same kind and one of another kind. So you see that readily when you read this in Greek and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The American Standard says anathema. Again, that's Galatians 1, 6 through 8. That's strong language. Let the person who teaches another kind of gospel from what I preach be cut off from you. Well, to be severed from them meant to be lost. Get rid of them. They're doing you no good. Paul had set forth the true pattern of sound words. And now he warns all against corrupting that pattern. In other words, such a one should be accursed and is a curse. Now, why was the apostle, not only Paul, but others, so firm about this? Well, listen to him. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, and neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. And he tells the church in Philippi concerning this gospel that he is set for the defense of this sound doctrine, of this pattern, of this divine blueprint, Philippians 1.17. Jesus is the designer of it. He's the architect of it. The Holy Spirit has revealed it. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6.17. Now the Word of God is quick and powerful, alive and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Paul would tell Timothy, preach the word. B. 
be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after them, their own themselves shall they heap in themselves each your itching ears and they'll desire to receive fables rather than the truth. You wonder how a person could do that, but that just goes to show you how you can be deceived if you're not cautious, if you're not careful. You know how much uh, I like to study history. Especially I like American history. And I like the Civil War studies, World War II. But I like all of it. People can be deceived so easily. In fact, Stonewall Jackson was killed because certain ones of his own soldiers shot him. He was out between the lines. It was dark. He shouldn't really been out there as a general, but he was. Certain North Carolinians uh, thought it, they were Union Cavalry. And they gave one volley into them, and one of those with Jackson cried out, Stop, we're your own men. But one of those said, No, not pour it to them. That's the enemy. Well, it wasn't a whole lot, but look what it did. That happened more than you realize. But the point is, in the army of the Lord, if we don't hold true to the truth and become deceived, we can end up stoning a Stephen, who if we'd listened to him, would have saved our souls. So his blueprint had to be faithfully followed without addition, subtraction, or alteration. And it still must. The only way the church is on this earth it's because people have kept the doctrine of Christ pure. When you go back and study the restorers in the early 19th century, what they sacrificed without any help but their own love of God and zealous desire to know the truth, and they're taking the Bible and the Bible only, laid the groundwork for things to go on to where we are today, at least among the faithful. And yet through those many, many years, nearly 200, I guess it's been 200 actually, many have fallen by the wayside. Many splits have come in the church. That didn't just happen because people stayed with the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, the divine pattern. It happened because people left it. And that's the way the first great apostasy took place. So what then should be our attitude, our mindset, Toward any who would change the pattern of God, the inspired blueprint. Well, you know what the answer is. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If any come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. 2 John 9 through 11. That's the way it worked in the first century when people apostatized. And that's the way it always will work. For the devil to get us to lose our soul in a hell, he just simply has to get us away from the divine pattern. And that's all too easy for some, for they never had much of it in their mind in the first place. So not only are we to follow the pattern of sound words which God has given, but we're to confront those who would teach contrary to it, and we're to withdraw ourselves from them and not give them any encouragement whatsoever. If we condone their actions, God says we become partakers of their evil deeds in opposing the divine pattern. I'm quite sure there are many members of the church who have never risen up and taught explicitly a false doctrine, and yet they're going to be lost because they didn't want their favorite preacher or their favorite elder or their mama, daddy, or son, or daughter opposed. 
And they didn't oppose them. They never said anything wrong. And a great many preachers fill pulpits all over this land today who are not going to teach any false doctrine from the pulpit, but they're going to leave unsaid a lot of things that ought to be said to that audience to keep them within the boundary of sound doctrine. Well, because they don't teach the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and those parts of the truth that need especially to be applied to their audience, they're not going to be saved. Ignoring or rejecting this divine pattern will destroy the church, whether it has to do with the very gospel, God's power, corrupting it, or the organization that the New Testament sets out for the church, or the worship of the church, whatever it may be that's been delivered in the words of the New Testament. We just simply must know the difference in opinions and likes and dislikes and what are obligatory that can't be changed. Somebody would have come in and say, well, we can partake of the Lord's Supper on any day of the week outside the service. The assembly of the saints. There are a lot of people that wouldn't bother. Somebody comes in and says, well, now, if it bothers you to sing with a mechanicness or a music, we'll have a service, especially for you. But for those that doesn't bother, we'll have a service where you can do whatever you want to in the way of music. That won't bother you. They're doing it all over the country. And I'm talking about churches of Christ. They don't deserve to have that name on their marquee or above the door unless they want to put apostate church of Christ. And yet, brethren, sit there, twiddling their thumbs, and think that harmlessness is holiness. Mark that down. A great many things I've heard over the years from brethren is that they think harmlessness is holiness. And the one who rebukes those who deviate from sound doctrine becomes the evil one. Whether it's acts of worship or whatever it might be, we are to do only what is authorized in the New Testament. Now, if you don't want to go to heaven, just ignore the principles of this particular sermon. Just think whatever you want to think. And enjoy good words and fair speeches while you may. And look for a church, you won't have to go far. The deal's in that. And they may be able to have a, no telling what going on in the way of fun and games. But have a gang of people there. There's just something going on every night of the week. They're not interested, though, whether the divine pattern authorized it or not. That's just what they want to do. Well, the whole Bible is full of material, especially the Old Testament where the people did as they pleased. But that same Bible points out it got them lost too. We, whether we're two or three or whether we're 50 or whether we're 500, we have no choice if heaven's to be our home than to trust and obey what the Lord has given us. Now, these things could be developed into specific problems where people have departed from the divine pattern. But this in general becomes an attitude that will hit at various places according to what people want and like and that they stand for and don't stand for. Are you a Christian like the Bible defines a Christian? If not, you need to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John 8, 24, Romans 10, 17. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And be baptized into Christ by His authority for the remission of your sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Romans 6, 3 and 4. 1 Peter 3, 21. Anybody that comes teaching that any one of those steps in God's plan of salvation is not necessary is a false teacher. And as Paul said, he ought to be cut off. The Lord adds people who do that from the heart to his church. And in that church, they're under his head. 
He has the final authority. Thus, the church is organized, and it worships, and each member lives according to the same divine pattern. Thus, we're one, although there are many members, because we all operate by the same authority, the divine pattern. If you're a child of God and you've wandered from that pattern in individual living, then you need to repent of those things, turn from them, walk the straight and narrow way with great determination and fervency, the straight and narrow way of truth in living the Christian life. Repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. If you need to obey the gospel, then we invite you to do so while we stand and sing.